Welcome everyone. This is our second public meeting for this project. We hit a bit of a um, slowdown when the pandemic hit. So it's been a while since we've got together, but uh, this past fall, we kind of rebooted this project, got it going again in earnest, and we are now um, back. And tonight we'll be presenting some draft alternatives for everyone to consider and discuss. Hopefully everyone had a chance to watch the recorded video in advance. I think that'll um, really, really help you out. Um, but if not, uh, I think you'll be able to follow along reasonably well. And just a real, real quick, this study is, you know, funded um, by the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission with federal transportation dollars. It was uh, requested by the city of Burlington as part of our annual work program. And so they are contributing a local match to that and we've hired VHB as our consultant to uh, take care of this work. And also Diane Meyerhoff with Third Sector Associates to take care of the public involvement. Hopefully you've received some emails from her and that's why you knew about this meeting and are here joining us tonight. And I don't think I have anything else to add unless anyone else has some intro stuff. Nicole, if you want, feel free. If not, give it right over to Drew to kick this off. I think I'm all set. Thanks for kicking us off. And yeah, let's turn it over to Drew. All right, thank you, Jason and Nicole for the introduction there. And yep, just to bring everybody in, this is our Colchester Avenue bikeways, parking and intersection safety study. So in order to hold plenty of space for discussion tonight, uh, we want to remind you that the presentation slide that we're presenting here and a pre-recorded version of the presentation are also available on the website. And we encourage you to visit those materials as we'll be skipping through the project purpose and need and a bit of a project refresher uh, in the interest of getting through the corridor concepts and alternatives evaluation and most importantly to your public comment. So just a quick reintroduction of the team here. Um, as Jason kicked us off here, him and his colleague Marshall Distel are with the CCRPC. We also have Nicole Loesch and Elizabeth Ross from the city of Burlington uh, on the project team and then representing the consultant team uh, here with BHB is myself, Jen Conley, and Karen Sentoff. And also on this slide, you'll see the, the list of names of our advisory committee. Um, a number of members, I'm sure, are among us tonight. And just a quick reintroduction to the project scope and schedule. So back in December of 2019, we had our first public meeting, which was our local concerns meeting followed by um, a couple advisory committee meetings mixed in along with our alternatives assessment. We then did have a bit of a project hiatus due to um, managing and navigating as I'm sure everyone has been doing so the COVID-19 pandemic. And now we are resuming uh, public outreach process for this project today with the alternatives presentation meeting and followed by this will be a development of the preferred alternative um, as well as uh, an advisor, a third and final advisory committee meeting and then um, draft of the scope and uh, a presentation to the city council. And I'm going to send it over to my colleague, Karen. Thanks, Drew. So what you're seeing on the screen now is really the guide for this presentation. Uh, we'll be going through the alternatives basically uh, from left to right on this screen here. Um, so we'll start with the uh, western end of the corridor of, e of Colchester Avenue, um, sort of west of East Avenue, then move on to concepts um, east of East Avenue, and then uh, to bring it home, we'll talk through the alternatives for the intersection with Colchester Avenue and East Avenue. Karen, before uh, you begin, should we just share that if folks need to um, ask a clarifying question, that they can do so in the question and answer pod? Um, and I will you know, alert uh, either Drew or Karen, whoever's speaking, that there's a clarifying question. But we are going to wait for feedback until the presentation is complete. Yep. And after, so quickly, after we get through um, each section here, sort of represented as the columns. Uh, in this table. Um, we will pause for a moment um, to make sure that there aren't any further clarifying questions because we understand there 
there is a lot of content here. Um, and so we'll sort of go section by section and just make sure that um, everyone sort of has a good grasp on what we're presenting and, and the information regarding um, each segment of the, of the corridor. I understand it's a long corridor, so stick with us. Um, so Karen, again, I apologize. Um, Jack raised his hand. Jack, could I steer you to the question and answer pod? You, if you can't um, locate that, that is down in the middle of your screen, at the bottom of your screen. Um, for now, we're just going to take kind of questions through through the question and answer pod instead of by raising hands. Sorry, Karen. No problem. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is just really a reference slide for folks who have been following along um, with the project sort of prior to the hiatus that we took with the pandemic. Um, and it's just regarding the naming convention that we were using for some of the concepts that we had evaluated very early on in the process. So really just for reference. All right, so we're gonna start with the western end of the corridor, sort of west of East Avenue um, between Prospect, Prospect Street and um, East Ave. And we're gonna look first at concept one west, which is on street separated bike lanes. And here you're seeing concept one west in cross section at the top and then plan view at the bottom for that first section between Prospect and the hospital entrance. Um, some important features to note in this section include that we are shifting curbs to better accommodate those uh, bicycle lanes with a buffer and a vertical element. Um, here we're also holding the back of sidewalk to the existing back of sidewalk. So there's really not um, any implications in terms of right away beyond the back of sidewalk. Um, than what's out there today. And um, the newly constructed shared use path on the south side um, that we're all pretty excited about uh, is flanked by a narrow green belt in this option um, with on-street bike lanes um, having that three foot buffer and, and that vertical element such as a bollard. And here we're seeing a continuation of that concept from the pre previous slide. So this is between UVM Medical Center entrance and East Avenue. Um, for now, let's ignore the treatment at the intersection and really just focus on the cross section here. Um, understanding that, again, we're holding that space for the three foot buffer with the bike lane. So better accommodating that bike lane along this section. Um, we're, we're holding the back of sidewalk where we can, um, but in some places we're going as far as four feet back from the uh, existing back of sidewalk. And again, here we're seeing that newly constructed uh, side, side path on the south side um, continues along this stretch. All right. Thanks, Karen. And just as a reminder to everybody, at the end of the this Western section, we will have any uh, slight pause for any clarifying questions, but for now, we're going to continue to proceed with the concept. So now we're going to look at concept two for the West end of the corridor, um, which is the concept including raised and separated bike lanes. So as you'll see in the cross section and the layout, the bike lanes in this case are both horizontally and vertically separated from the roadway. Um, this design will also have a slight vertical separation from the sidewalk um, to define, clearly define space for each uh, user. We kind of have a sample photograph. It's slightly hard to tell um, the vertical delineation between the sidewalk and the raised bike lane, but it's, we're talking a very slight, slight change of grade just to emphasize that separation. Um, there is enough width here to call for grass strips wide enough on both sides to allow for new tree plantings. And even with the widened uh, grass strip, the area of impact does not extend similar to concept one beyond the existing back of sidewalk. And um, just given the vertical separation in this case, between difference being the main difference between concept one and two, uh, there's naturally more space for bikes and pets to operate separate from traffic. 
Uh, continuing along this section, the grass strip does narrow. Um, however, there's still space for a key feature uh, in this concept uh, being separated space or uh, the creation of space to allow for left turns for bicyclists. And during our local concerns meeting back in December of 2019, there was a clear desire for improving uh, conditions for uh, bicyclists along the corridor, particularly in the realm of left turns onto and off of the corridor. Um, and so this concept accomplishes that while keeping turning bicyclists separate from vehicle traffic and separate horizontally from through bicyclist traffic. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the first, the first two concepts here for concept two West. And so as is the case with these sort of studies, we then like to do uh, side by side comparisons. And so to in order to better understand the impact and implication of these design concepts, we've developed uh, this, evalu this evaluation matrix um, to compare side by side the critical concept factors such as cost, uh, safety impacts, and impact to the community character. These cost evaluations uh, are presented on a high level relative cost scale. So for these, the big cost generators are, um, in both cases, both concepts are moving the curb and widening the roadway. And uh, as we've mentioned, these are generally significant reconstruction efforts because as has been touched on in previous public outreach efforts, you know, the, the short term changes to Colchester Avenue, the project team feels are, are what's currently out there with the recent side path uh, improvements as well as the striped bike lane and enhanced pedestrian treatments at some crossings. Um, the larger cost seen here indicated by the third dollar sign uh, for concept two comes from the design implications of raising the bike lanes uh, to near sidewalk grade as opposed to concept one which carries striped but vertically separated bike lanes within the existing cartway of the road. Uh, looking at safety, you know, these two concepts provide protected and separated facilities for all modes using this corridor, uh, being pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. As a result, we see improvements to safety across the board. Um, the main difference, as we have covered between concept one and two, uh, in particular for bicyclist safety, is that we see concept two potentially being more apt to pull in the uh, quote unquote interested but concerned type, interested but concerned, excuse me, type of cyclists. Uh, with the on-street separated facilities, as there still is a certain level of perceived exposure from vehicle traffic when you are on the same grade, whereas these users are more likely to be comfortable, we think, raised and separated from ve vehicle traffic. Uh, the concepts see improvements to pedestrian safety as well, because by currently using the shared use path along the south side of the road, um, now have an exclusive facility to operate in. Uh, looking at the impacts, you'll notice similar impacts between the two concepts across the board. Uh, you know, we, we assess these impacts against all of the number, the number of things you see here, ut existing utilities, right of ways, uh, overall thoughts on constructability, impacts to parking, trees, uh, and then finally any historical or archaeological impacts to the corridor. Uh, the two concepts here match up pretty much pretty much the same across the board um, with the similar impacts to the utilities. It's, it's known that there are above ground utilities along this corridor that will would need to be potentially relocated or modified in some way, shape or form to make sure that these streetscape improvements fit. Um, the right of way impacts, there are no, no impacts to the right of way as Karen touched on. Uh, each concept sees a little bit of a shift of the back of sidewalk, but that still plays, uh, still stays, excuse me, within public right of way. And then there's no existing parking along the corridor, therefore we don't have any changes to parking. Um, and there could be moderate impacts to some existing trees, but we also are, are recognizing that the new concepts do present um, some tree belt opportunity for new planting. Uh, looking at the community character, concept one generally holds the existing aesthetic uh, character of the corridor with the striped bike lanes, however, now uh, you know, separated via a buffer and a vertical element. Well, concept two we see as an improvement uh, as the green belt is widening for nearly the full length of the corridor and in particularly widening west of the UVA Medical Center driveway allows uh, for tree plantings and then assessing both of these concepts against the uh, purpose and need. Uh, this checks both of those boxes. Uh, so now uh, before we take, before we jump into the eastern section of the corridor, uh, we're looking for any clarifying questions. And again, these are not broad statements or thoughts. We'll save all of the time at the end for those. These are simply, if you're 
if you're a bit confused and just seeking clarification about one or two of the changes along the corridor, uh, one or two of the proposed elements of each of these concepts, uh, we ask that you please use your raised hand feature and we'll unmute you for clarifying questions. Again, please, please stay away from any grand statements or thoughts at this point. We will have time for that at the end. Um, and then prior to, prior to that discussion, we would like to hear from, from all of our participants about what your initial preference is given the introduction to this concept. So after we do have those clarifying questions, we will show a brief poll to gauge folks' first impressions of the concepts presented. Drew, the first question is a clarifying question, wondering if the impacts factor in stormwater runoff and how that, how that is evaluated in the evaluation criteria. Uh, could you say that one more time, Jen? But it was in regard to stormwater. It, it's in regards to stormwater runoff and whether that has been accounted for in the evaluation criteria. Uh, that has not been part of part of the evaluation criteria. Um, generally, that kind of occurs, and somebody please feel free to step in. That kind of occurs in the more in the design, the preliminary engineering design phase. Um, that would, of course, be a consideration because we recognize that with the relocation of curbs, there is a certain amount of stormwater infrastructure that would need to also be relocated. Um, I think you could look to other examples in the city to see some of the um, kind of common um, common countermeasures that the city has been implementing. I think we we could consider some of those along this corridor, but that would be more uh, more a question addressed in the preliminary engineering design phase of a project like. Is it correct though that the impervious surface and the two alternatives is similar, so we would not expect a big difference in the stormwater runoff impact? Uh, yeah, that's that's fair to say. We are widening the roadway. Um, however, the Im the implication of additional impervious surface is somewhat mitigated by the inclusion of grass strips and um, tree buffers along the project corridor. Okay, one cl other clarifying question was what is meant by modified tree impact on the north side of the green belt? Modified impact on trees on the north side of the green belt. Is that, a, I presume that's referring to the uh, evaluation matrix? I, I would assume as much, yes. Okay, uh, let me just clarify myself here. Um, I believe it was moderate impacts was the language used. Um, okay. And then there was another question about one version having plantings and one does not. And if I, it, I think similar to the stormwater impact, I think the amount of green space in each alternative would be similar. It's just where it's located, correct? Correct. So that was referring to the width available uh, west of the UVM Medical Center driveway relative to that, which is available to the east. So we have it in our current concepts that there would be six feet of available uh, grass strip space west of the UVM Medical Center, which would be wide enough for tree plantings. And then to the east, in the interest of avoiding any private property and right-of-way impacts, we have a narrower grass strip of four feet, which generally is not considered sufficient for tree plantings. And then finally, there is a question, and I think we got this in some of our preliminary feedback, that has to do with how bus stops will be accommodated with the raised bike lanes. And I believe that's a detail that would be worked out later, but there are examples of how that can be accommodated. Yep. Uh, examples not being presented here, but yeah. there there are there are design examples, yes, in in the field that we would we would absolutely reference and make sure that uh, we are minimizing or mitigating any potential conflicts between bicyclists, pedestrians, and uh, transit users. In the final clarifying question, oh wait, there's a couple. One is how do cyclists turn left on the separated raised path? Um, so that was touched on uh, in, I can, I can click back to it because it is a bit hard to see. Um, so in, if you look at, for instance, Fletcher Place, uh, where there's a crosswalk proposed, we're also proposing a bicycle crossing and you can see a slight shift in the um, gray area, which is otherwise considered the separated bike lane in this concept where a bicyclist would um, pull to the left 
and then assess traffic and then um, yield as needed and or operate. I believe, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, this is where an RRFP currently exists so they could activate the RRFP to then dismount their bike and cross the street or wait for a gap in traffic to then cross at this crossing location. There is also one other question about whether we have spoken with GMT and I can answer that because they do sit on our committee. So we do um, have some input from GMT as we move through the process. Um, and then there's final one question about, um, you just said something happens in the design phase, um, but what level is their involvement um, at this stage? I think that's referring back to, to GMT. And as I said, they are involved at the committee level. Um, and so we are getting input from them as we go, um, but obviously those details will be worked out later. And Drew, I think that's it. If you want to um, go to the poll yeah. and we can move along. Yeah, I think mm, Matt, I think we'll need to all right, yep, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. Everyone out there should just see this pop up on your screen. If you don't see it, go ahead and click the poll button at the bottom. And we've got our first question up. And we've got about 60% voting so far. Let's give it another uh, maybe 15 seconds or so. Okay, we'll give you another uh, five seconds or so to go ahead and vote in the poll. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. We've hit a minute. And let me share those results with everybody. Well, it seems at this end of the quarter, there is a strong preference for concept two, which is the race separated bike lanes. I'm just noticing that Dave has his hand up and I don't know if he, was wants to speak. His question wasn't clarified. Oh, Dave, would you be able to um, put a question into the chat, into the either the chat or into the question and answer pod? Looks like he did put his hand down. Okay, but, maybe um, it was an error when he was uh, responding to something. Oh, David says I'm okay. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Good to be okay. All right, I'm gonna uh, shut down the results of the first poll. All right. We all set uh, on this section then, Drew? Yep. Uh, we do have one hand raised now. Oh. We do, Jack's hand is raised. Jack, did you have a question you want to put in the... It says my question was answered live, but I don't believe it was. All right, Jack, I apologize if I missed you here. Um, yeah, I will just allow Jack to talk really quickly just so we can finish off this section. Yeah. Okay, Jack, you should be able to unmute now. Go ahead. Jack, are you able to unmute? I apologize if I missed your question. I his, um, I'm sorry, Jen. Uh, his, his question was, could the project team explain why it is that raised separated bike lanes are not considered any safer than the on-street lanes in the evaluation matrix? Um, sorry, yeah, my can... connection. Oh. My connection got messed up. Did I miss my window? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, but... That... Uh, Matt did just read your question, Jack. I don't know if oh, you did okay. want to repeat it, um, but it no, if you sounds just like read it, it, that's that's fine. Yeah. So, why are raised uh, separated bike lanes not considered safer than the on-street separated bike lanes? Um, it's 
in the case of actual safety, it's, it's, I guess it's, this is why we touched on this the way we did. It's kind of a measure of actual versus perceived safety. Um, raised separated bike lanes are, are in, in actuality, a very similar in nature to an on-street, but still vertically separated bike lane. So we thought it was pertinent to mention that, you know, when you, when you're assessing these two facility types, they are actually, you know, considered equally safe against each other. However, there is the matter of perceived safety, which perhaps is what you're alluding to. And that's why we touched on the interested but concerned population of bicyclists. When they see a raised separated facility that is off the street, we think that that facility is more than likely going to pull in a larger cycling population to, to use because they will perceive that it is safer because they are, they see it as, you know, vertically separated from vehicles in addition to being horizontally separated from, from motorists. There was one final clarification question on this section, which was um, how do cyclists go left or straight at East Ave in the raised option? And we'll get into those intersection alternatives um, in, in a few minutes. That's the third column. And we'll, we'll get to that a little later, Lonnie. So we'll save your question to that time. Yep. Yeah, we'll circle back to we're kind of moving left to right as Karen touched on. So we'll circle back to East Avenue and the alternatives presented there and make sure to hopefully hit on all those things. And then of course, if we do not, after, after the fact, uh, please feel free to raise that question. We'll be sure to address it. All right, Karen. All righty. So jumping into the Eastern end of the corridor. So this is between East Avenue and Barrett Street. Uh, so going down the hill on Colchester Avenue towards the Winooski River. And we'll be starting with Concept 1 East, which will present the on-street separated bike lane. So similar to uh, Concept 1 West, this is a continuation of that concept, which changes the curb to curb width to better accommodate on-street separated bike lanes with buffers and a vertical element. And the key features that you're seeing here, both in plan view and cross section, um, are that there's a five foot bike lane with a three foot buffer and a vertical element. Um, in this section, there are a number of driveways. So that vertical element will be limited in terms of where it can be just um, to continue to allow access to those driveways. Um, so we'll keep those uh, access points open, but we'll have to limit the number of bollards that can be out there. Uh, and although the right-of-way line is wide here, um, beyond the back of existing sidewalk, uh, we attempted to limit the impacts to those adjacent properties uh, with this concept. Um, and, you know, really wanted to limit the impact to that space that folks are using for parking, uh, off-street parking or front yard space. Along this section, um, there is a minimal green belt. Um, we're, we're really tight through this section. Um, and so the segment between Centennial Entrance and Greenmount Cemetery uh, would have an expanded green belt, um, but the segment in front of the cemetery um, and heading down the hill would require no green belt just based on the um, slope limits that were uh, in the field there. Um, and so we'd be limited in, in terms of the green belt space in that section. Um, moving on to the, the continuation of that down the hill um, and down to Barrett Street. Like the previous slide, um, along this section, we have that five foot bike lane with the three foot buffer and vertical element. Um, we're showing minimal green belt, even though we are well within the right of way, again, to limit those impacts, to front yard space and off street parking for the adjacent properties here. Um, and we carry that minimal green belt space um, all along this, this segment of the corridor. All right, thank you, Karen. So we're gonna jump now back into concept two and take a look at um, how it looks east of the East Avenue intersection. 
Um, so it is worth noting that while the cross section shown at the top of the page represents the majority of the corridor, it's not indicative of the entire length. It is just kind of the, the most that uh, is gonna be seen here. And you can see in the graphic that for instance, east of Campus Kitchen, we have a wider green belt, which allow for tree plantings for a portion of this segment, but then the tree belt uh, and even the grass strip narrow completely around the curve as Karen just touched on in concept one as well due to the adjacency to the Green Mount um, Cemetery and potential slope impacts as well as archeological impact zones. Uh, the grass strip does return east of the cemetery, excuse me, however, it is kept narrow at that three foot width. Um, and this is to avoid any impacts beyond the existing back of sidewalks um, and while you know the, the project team sees that as uh, within public right away, there's something to be said for the fact that the you know the resident utilization of this space is fairly high, whether that is for recreation or or parked uh, private vehicles. All right, moving on to uh, concept three. Um, just a reminder for mobility, i.e. bicycles and pedestrians, this cross-section is generally the same as concept two. Uh, the big difference comes with attempting to address the need for parking for residents and parking to support local businesses along this segment of the corridor. Um, so we can he see here in concept three, the uh, balance of trying to implement the on-street parking while maintaining consistent facilities for uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, given the presence of businesses like Kathy's Flowers and Campus Kitchen, there was an expressed interest for this parking to be located on the Southern side of the corridor. Um, so that's what you're seeing here with the enhancements made uh, east of University Road and a few locations. Uh, now, just for everyone's we're not continuing east because continuing east of concept three and concept three a down the hill it's the same uh, cross section and layout as concept two just to um, avoid any questions about that so concept three a um, as conversations developed with campus kitchen it was noted that there was a strong desire to evaluate the possibility of maintaining short-term high turnover uh, on street parking immediately in front of their location. And as such, this specialized concept 3A was created. And so concept 3A mimics concept three and its inclusion of uh, on street parking in select lower impact locations while also pursuing, as seen in this layout, uh, on street parking immediately in front of campus kitchen. Uh, given the need to balance all users in this very tight cross section, this concept calls for a change to the corridor dynamics for bicyclists and pedestrians, as you'll see in between uh, Timbal Parkway and University Road. Highlighted on this slide is the creation of a narrow shared use and or slow or mixing zone space for bicyclists and pedestrians through the frontage of Campus Kitchen. Uh, given the high vehicular turnover, the project team believes it makes sense to encourage a slow zone at this location anyway. When you think about high turnover parking areas, whether it's pickup drop off or, uh, you know, food pickup, these which is ever more important these days to try and uh, build in that curbside management piece to the projects as we look at them, you know, we see, we see these being, you know, 15 minute or 30 minute parking spaces that are primarily uh, having people exit their vehicle, performing a pickup, then entering their vehicle and uh, returning to, to their trip. So when we look at bicycles and pedestrian facilities adjacent to that sort of curbside activity, um, we see a need to slow those users down. Obviously pedestrians walk at a fairly slow, slow pace anyway, but just to make, make everyone aware with bicycles coming through the corridor that there's gonna be a change in the dynamics of this section. We're going to need you to go slower to maintain and manage safety for all users of this particular area of the project. And, you know, this concept in the grand screen and the grand scheme, excuse me, represents a compromise for all modes in the greater interest of uh, addressing all of the needs of the project. So if I may, a clarification on the cross section, Jason Stuff will notice it is labeled as an 11 foot planting strip, but to be clear, that is not a new planting strip. That is in most oh, yeah. cases, already what is lawn in front of folks' houses, but is within the right of way. Yes, that, that, is, not, that is not to be considered new infrastructure, merely uh, a, a naming 
from the um, software we use to develop the cross sections mm -hmm. to depict this project area. Yep. Karen. All righty. So jumping into concept four East, uh, we'll be presenting a shared use path to help accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists on one side of the roadway. So here on your screen, you're seeing uh, a shared use path on the north side of the corridor. This is coupled with a raised separated bike lane and sidewalk on the south side. Putting the shared use path on the north side was in anticipation of slow uphill cyclists. Uh, the speed of the uphill cyclists makes mixing the bikes and peds in this section really more tolerable than um, mixing downhill cyclists and peds together, given the rate of speed of a downhill cyclist, especially in this steep segment. Um, particularly in the steeper segment uh, that we'll see on the next screen. Uh, and in this section, the back of sidewalk in this concept is generally within one to two feet um, of the existing back of sidewalk along this entire stretch. So the impacts do reach beyond the existing back of sidewalk, but the impact is pretty minimal. Again, one to two feet to better accommodate that mixed uh, shared use path on the north side. And here's a continuation of that concept down the hill towards Winooski. Um, the shared use path here is on the west side or the uphill side. Um, again, you know, it's more desirable on that side given the, the speed of cyclists um, getting up the hill there and pedestrians walking along that section. And again, this would accommodate that um, separated uh, bike lane on the west side, um, so the downhill cyclists would be still separated from the pedestrians. And again, in this cross section, uh, the design would stay within one to two feet of the existing back of sidewalk. So uh, we attempted to minimize the impacts to that front yard or um, you know, off street parking space uh, that folks are utilizing. Um, we will see you know, one to two feet of impact beyond where the existing back of sidewalk is out there today. Before you go on, Drew, just so that you can be thinking of this, Karen just touched on it on that alternative. There have been a number of questions about what the resulting, although the impact is in the right of way, what is the resulting in each section for each con concept? How much beyond that the existing back of sidewalk we're going? so that they can really do a comparison of how it's going to feel to their front yards. Just, just so you know, as you go through that, that's kind of a, a question that they, they'd like to understand based on concerns of it coming closer to the houses and to the parking spots to just really understand how the options differ. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Jen. So, uh, Bear with us here. This is going to be going to be a few lengthy slides as we compare these five concepts for the eastern section of the corridor. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, the evaluation of these for the west end, the evaluation matrices developed compare each of these eastern corridor concepts uh, uh, across the four same uh, factors being cost, safety, uh, overall impacts uh, to the built environment and community character. The costs are once more presented on a relative scale. For this assessment, concept one was evaluated lower on the scale as the only significant impact is the widening of the curb width uh, and residual work that comes from that. Whereas concepts two through four include that work in addition to, establish, to establishing new raised and separated facilities uh, off the street as we have seen. Uh, now looking at safety along this eastern section of the corridor, in general, the concepts are providing improvements over the existing conditions because we are providing a separation of uh, all various modes. Now, as you'll see here, uh, there are slight discrepancies looking at concepts 3A and 4. Concept 3A, as we discussed, brings in the trade-off of accommodating additional parking, 
with creating a shared uh, slow mixing zone for bicyclists and pedestrians across that frontage. Uh, similarly, similarly, concept four has a shared facility uh, along the north side for bicyclists and pedestrians. And as a result, we're calling this out um, as a combination of no change slash a slightly worse case for pedestrians for these concepts based on the fact that in the existing condition, pedestrians have their own space along the sidewalk and bikes are generally operating um, in the street. Now, we all obviously recognize that some cyclists choose to ride on the sidewalk. However, in looking at kind of apples to oranges here, we do need to, to fully assess the changes based on the existing environment and the existing uh, corridor accommodations for modes based on what's being proposed. And lastly, all concepts uh, represent an improvement to vehicular safety, given that the travel lanes are now exclusively for vehicles. Uh, the impacts of the corridor uh, concepts on the eastern segment are fairly consistent across the concepts as well as we've touched on. All concepts will have impacts to utilities and will require significant uh, relocation and reconstruction. Uh, in this assessment, evaluating parking and right of way impacts go hand in hand in a way. As we've discussed, while none of the concepts being considered have actual right of way impacts, concepts 3 and 3A. Three naturally require more space to accommodate on-street parking alongside the proposed multimodal facilities. So kind of touching on Jen's question in this case, we're, we're looking at you know seven to eight uh, more feet of impact in those locations. Now those were deliberately chosen to be located in areas of lower impact, but there still is that increased um, impact to that space utilization based on the need for park. Uh, these, these locations do not, in, encroach into private parking, but rather impact space within um, private right of way, as we touched on being utilized by residents. Regarding impacts to trees, all concepts are anticipated to have some level of impact with concept three and three A again, presenting uh, slightly more significant impacts given the need for more width. Uh, just to reiterate, the community character is really focused on the question, does the concept improve the aesthetics of the corridor and meet the preset project purpose and need? Um, we see, for the most part, yes, obviously, again, in concept one, given that the improvements are predominantly striping and uh, pavement markings, there's no change to the aesthetic, but across the board for all the other concepts, we see improvements being made. Uh, this satisfies the perfect purpose and need statement uh, is met across the board with a yes. However, there are asterisks on concepts one, two, and four, and this is in regard to parking, which we've called out here. Um, you know, the existing on-street parking that exists along Colchester Avenue is either reduced or removed in all of these concepts with concepts three and three A uh, retaining some of this on-street parking. And you know, we're calling this as, as an asterisk because it has been identified that uh, business parking needs to be um, you know, further addressed as these, as these conversations uh, continue. Now, some of those conversations have happened and we have identified potential for additional parking opportunities adjacent to the corridor, but we are flagging these, these concepts one, two, and four with an asterisk uh, pertaining to the addressing of the parking need in the purpose and need statement. All right, and so before we jump into the intersection alternatives, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jen, I already see she's come off mute, which oh. to me suggests there are. We have, we do have a list. So I do think you kind of clarified a little bit about what the impacts would be along the different sections as to um, impact. There was a follow-up question that actually connected as well to trees as to kind of which section has tree impacts um, where those tree impacts might be that you think may be happening. And I don't know if you have additional information to um, provide on that. Uh, I know, Karen, do you have anything to weigh in on here? Yeah, I guess tree? I can just give some clarification around what we were considering um, moderate or major impacts to the, to the existing trees that are out there. Um, so, you know, the range of um, six existing greenbelt trees, four trees that are behind the sidewalk in the existing condition, 
that was considered a moderate impact. Um, so, you know, there is going to be an impact to the green belt and the trees that are existing in the green belt in some locations based on, again, that relocation of curb um, and the significant work that would go into that. Um, but really the impacts beyond the back of walk um, were limited at most to four trees um, being potentially impacted. Um, and then to give you a sense of what we're saying are major impacts, um, you know, in that case, we're talking about 11 greenbelt trees along the, um, the entire corridor being impacted with that pretty significant curb work to, to shift curbs around um, and get curbs in a more desirable location. Um, and then as many as 10 trees being impacted um, behind the sidewalk or the existing sidewalk. Um, and just to give you a sense to, you know, this would definitely um, need to be evaluated by, um, you know, arborists um, beyond the capability of, of site walk and, and identifying those locations and would definitely depend um, on that preliminary design where, you know, we would be able to limit those impacts potentially, but um, that was uh, an evaluation of, you know, the existing trees that are out there and, and our sense of where they may Karen, you just lost your sound for a moment. Are you speaking again? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Oh, you're back. You're good. Excellent. OK. Um, so that's just to give you a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about moderate versus major um, for these alternatives. But we, we had a couple of questions really raised specifically about that mixing zone, I believe, in front of Campus Kitchen. Um, one was someone didn't understand where the bikes go during that section. And there was also another question, if, if there is so much right of way, why couldn't all of that fit within the right of way? There should be room to have parking, the raised bike lane, et cetera. Um, was that looked at is the other question. Um, yeah, I can hit on that. So I think it might make sense just to go back to the slide to answer the um, can't that all fit in the right of way question. So I'm not sure how big folks screens are, but if you can identify the uh, campus kitchen location, it is two blue rectangles, also known as parcels over from the University Road uh, label. And to the east, you can see kind of what that what that space allocation would look like if we maintained on street parking, the grass strip, the separated bike lane, and the sidewalk. And now if you were to just picture that shifted west to being in front of campus kitchen, you really wouldn't have any any frontage left and people would be walking within a few feet of the entrance to campus kitchen. Now, as it currently stands, there are a couple picnic tables out there. There's also a driveway used by the by the owners for loading and unloading and um, parking during business hours and otherwise. So it, it would be a bit too crammed there. So there was a desire to kind of maintain as much as that, as much of that space as possible in this particular location, which is why this slow mixing zone was considered in addition to the anticipated higher curbside activity at this location relative to the other locations along the corridor, which are primarily residential. Um, okay, so and for clarification, in the mixing zone, the folks that are in the separated bike facility are then traveling in the same space as the pedestrians. Yeah, similar to uh, the existing uh, path west of East Avenue, the new path, you know, a, share, a shared use path sort of condition through that area. Another concern that was brought, on that, brought up on that shared use path idea is the fear, will some people think of that as a um, cycle track if it is wide enough? Is there a, any concern by the project team that folks might use it to travel in the wrong direction? Not necessarily down the hill, but perhaps in kind of the more flat area once you get to the top of the hill. Um. 
I think with any facility, there's concern that it will be used incorrectly. You know, uh, salmoning is the proper term, riding in the contraflow direction. Uh, we hope that this would be mitigated by the fact that there would be a well-established separated bike lane on the opposite side of the road. And in this location, there is a crossing right at University Road that has an RFB, so it'd be fairly easy to navigate to the other side of the road for westbound cyclists. Um, that question would also, you know, at that point, I don't know if we'd be anticipating if westbound cyclists would be coming from east of Colchester Avenue, where the separated bike lane still exists on the opposite side of the road, or if they'd be coming out of University Road. But the hope is that, you know, it would be known that there is a separated bike facility on the opposite side of the road in the appropriate level, uh, in the appropriate direction of travel. There was also a concern um, does the city have a plan for how to maintain the protected bike lanes during the winter? Might that be, um, I don't know if Nicole would want to step in with that or that might be more appropriate in the general discussion at the end of the presentation. That's up to Nicole if you'd like to answer it now or if we should get into that later. I can probably give a quick answer now. Yeah, the uh, we do have, uh, you know, a plan that's still kind of in development because protected bike lanes are still fairly new for Burlington, but we do meet with our maintenance team regularly. We have a meeting at the beginning of every winter to kind of evaluate what our plan is for the coming season, but we do maintain our protected lanes with the same sidewalk tractors that we use to clear our sidewalks. We have a couple of new sidewalk tractors this year. They're gonna try a slightly different plan for clearing them. And as of last year, we have a new strategy for um, actually removing the snow in the protected lanes instead of just plowing, which is what we had done in the past. So work in progress, but definitely something we are um, focusing on and trying to improve every year. Uh, a couple of other um, clarifying questions. When you say the trees are impacted, does that mean removed? And I think I can answer that, that at this point, we can't say for certain because uh, this is a planning level study. There is not detailed survey. And there also has not been an arborist to take a look at what the root situation is on all of those trees. But we just, um, those are the trees we as a design team would be concerned about. Um, we know there would be some impact to them and we would have to get additional information to clarify exactly what that impact would be. Um, there is far, further, um, there is some feedback and comment, which I'm gonna save and allow people to give kind of when we get to that section. Um, but if there was clarifying, uh, do we have a, a clarifying thing is, um, I guess it's more, more a question. I'm not sure if this is appropriate, but whether there is feedback or data indicating that a mixing zone does work well for a cyclist, that you would say that it is um, a good option for a cyclist is kind of the question. Um, have you seen that used other places, Drew, where you would say that the, the mixing zone is a good option for a bicyclist? Um, as far as a transition from a purely separated bike lane and a sidewalk adjacent to each other, navigating into a very specific short segment of shared space, then separating back out, um, the short answer is no. I don't think that. I think that is a is a, a condition saved for an extremely contained environment. Now the looking at this corridor in particular, you know, just west of this location, there is the existing shared use path, which is navigated by eastbound cyclists and east and westbound uh, pedestrians. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any post safety concerns, you know, picture that facility that is just a bit to the east along the project corridor, it would, it would not be a, a major concern given shared use paths exist, um, you know, on, on UVM's campus, elsewhere in the city, there they're not um, a totally foreign concept. And of course, you know, if, if such a concept were to be proceeded to engineering design, you know, uh, surface materials would be assessed, how to properly mark and sign for, for the uh, potentially unexpected condition, that would all be evaluated in the design phase in the hopes of minimizing um, any sort of as much conflict as possible. Um, I think someone is trying to gear up for their um, their response to the poll that's coming because they want a clarification now which option allows continuous bike lane down the hill. 
Uh, that would be every option. <laughs> Um, there was a, also a question, which is an interesting one. Are options 3A and 4 mutually exclusive, or could they be combined into one alternative? I think this goes back to an earlier question about one treatment on the flats and another treatment for the hill piece. Yeah. Um... Three three A could uh, the difference between three A and four on the south side of the road is um, negligible because that's that you know that concept four could exist on the north side of the road while concept three A still exists on the south side of the road. I think that would just have that would be further developed in a in kind of a potential engineering design phase of the project. You know, okay. that's a post post study question. Right, but on. yes, they could they could coexist. Just checking to see if there's any other clarifications on this. Oh, there actually was one question about why were why did the drive lane width vary? Why is it up to 12 feet in concept 3A? Um, and I can answer. I know in some situations we did have a drive lane width of 12 feet because that is a minimum if there is if there is a hard curb running up right next to it. Um, but was there was there a reason, Drew, in that location? I believe um, that along this tighter section and the continuation down the hill. Um, you know, the awareness of the proximity to the hospital and emergency vehicles using this corridor often um, with very high frequency, uh, accommodating that little bit of extra space in the travel lanes to be able to um, have folks be able to pull over and still get those emergency vehicles along this stretch, I think was a concern that was raised um, early on in the process and, and we're conscious of it when we were laying these out. There was also a clarification earlier, and I apologize for not noticing it. Um, how do bikes enter and exit the separated bike lanes? And I believe, um, Drew, I believe you touched on it a little bit, um, but did you want to touch on then again, how do bikes enter and exit separated bike lanes? Um, just to make sure I fully understand the question, it might help to have that person uh, who did ask that question um, unmute. I don't know. And okay. that would be Andrea Todd. Andrea would, I don't know if Matt, if we can um, unmute Andrea so she could just clarif clarify Andrea, the clarifying question. <laughs> Andrea, you should be uh, able to go ahead and unmute now. Yeah, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess my question is at the points of the shared use, like or the, the where, where you enter and exit those lanes, where do you get, where do you enter and exit them? Like going up Colchester Ave or going down Colchester Ave is like a commitment. <laughs> so how do you, how do you decide which you're committing to and how do you decide if you, you know, like if you want to, how do you enter those separate lanes? And then how do you exit them? <laughs> I guess, are you referring to like, if you're coming from a side street or seeking a side street destination? Yeah, I'm actually even thinking like that mix, mix, mixing zone would totally, is totally stressful and I would avoid that. I would drive, rather ride in the lane like I do on Pine Street rather than in a mixing zone. Um, and so if I wanted to exit and get in the street at the mixing zone, how would I exit this, the path? <laughs> So this is per pertaining to say, concept 3A as shown here? Yeah. Um, so I, in, in that specialized case, uh, you would do as you just said, you know, at uh, Tybalt Parkway, you would enter the road, um, bike in the lane, and then re-enter at University Road. So there's, it's, you have to wait to, I guess I, I, is it, if it's a continuous lane for bikes, where you have to wait to a street entrance to exit it? Yes. Uh, generally, yes. Yes, or a driveway. I mean, I don't know that that's the right answer, but on a driveway, you could you could go down or up. But typically, it's yeah. side streets where the ramps, you know, are set up to allow you to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, perhaps I, this is perhaps this is a better example. You can see, ultimately, 
you know, drive driveways and intersections would provide you your reprieve to enter and exit the facility while traveling along it. Karen, did you have? Yeah, I was just going to add that we were careful to give some sort of apron across from the side streets that aren't at, you know, a four way intersection, um, just so that folks could have that access to, you know, get in and get out um, as you're as you're referring to. So um, the example there on the screen, sorry, it's very small on my screen. Um, yeah. At, at Tibalt North of University Tibalt, and uh, yeah, north yeah. of Tibalt, we would we would have um, a, an apron there, so you could, if you were coming off of Tibalt Parkway, you know, make that left hand turn and get on to um, the bike lane on the far side. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I, there, there still seems to be a concern about the 12 foot lanes. The 12 foot lanes are used in any situation in which there is not um, a bike lane when there is a hard curb at the outside of the lane. It is important for emergency vehicles to have a full 12 feet. Now, when there is a buffer for a bike lane next to the vehicles, that does provide them with that additional, say, foot of width for. Think of the fire trucks mirrors, for example. So I know um, we keep getting that question. It's come up a couple of times. Um, speaking to emergency yeah. response in places where there is hard curb, the minimum amount um, of width needed to be 24 feet. That was one of the parameters for laying out these concepts. So that is why the concepts are laid out that way. We did have one request would be, Drew, would you mind very quickly just flipping through the alternatives? You don't need to speak to them, but just so people can remind to themselves of which was which before you pull. Certainly. Mm -hmm. All right, so starting with concept one, east, our on-street bike lanes. Concept two, east, our raised and separated bike lanes. Concept three, east, raised and separated with the enhancements in the interest of maintaining parking. 3A is the specialized concept with the enhancements to maintain parking and add short-term high turnover parking immediately in front of campus kitchen. And concept four is raised and separated bike lanes in the eastbound direction and a shared use path, path in the westbound direction. And now I will ask Matt to display the poll. And it looks like that is now live. If you could provide your gut reactions, please. And they are fast and furious, Drew. Well, they <laughs> still remember which concept was which. <laughs> the responses are coming in. I appreciate that question. It was like they knew that no, it was good. Like yeah. homework coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> quiz. Run through the candidates one more time. <laughs> All right, we're already past 60% participation. Wonderful. 70, huh? A bit more of a split this time. So we'll give it another uh, 15 seconds or so. A minute seems to kind of be the magic number here. Got about five seconds left to vote. And we'll go ahead and close the poll and let me share the results. All right. Great. Thank, thank you, you Matt, and thank you all for your responses. Okay. So now we are going to uh, shift into a look at the alternatives at the Colchester uh, Avenue and East Avenue intersection. Hopefully you're all still with us. And uh, the first alternative we're gonna look at uh, staying on theme is the lowest overall impact option, which in this case are equipment and striping upgrades to the intersection of Colchester Ave and East Avenue. Uh, now, Karen will get into this uh, a bit more in a few slides. 
But in evaluating uh, the crash data for this intersection, which is considered a high crash location, the majority of crashes that occur here are uh, rear end type. And generally this is indicative of poor signal visibility, uh, signal head, signal face visibility at the intersection. Um, through our investigations to date, we found that the signal equipment at this intersection relative to the lane configurations and their alignment is not up to standard. So this first alternative proposes relocating the signal equipment as well as providing more bolstered pavement markings to improve the conspicuity of other modes at the intersection. Alternative two is uh, we'll look at a slightly more intensive involving a realignment of East Avenue as well as signal relocations and upgrades at the intersection, as well as a very important change to the bicycle lane uh, configuration at this intersection. So as we know, there's a less than desirable skew at the intersection, and this alternative proposes to realign East Avenue, bringing it to 90 degrees with Colchester Avenue. This will help in addressing visibility concerns, as well as concerns about the speeds at which left turns are made um, from Colchester Avenue onto East Avenue. Um, there is also, as you'll see on the north side of the intersection, a realignment of the north side of the intersection um, onto the UVM uh, Trinity campus in that location. And the other significant change that will have a major impact, we think, on bicycle comfort and safety at this intersection will be the design to keep bicyclists separated in the bike lane to the right of the travel lanes. Uh, now, those that currently bike the corridor know that in this case, there is a short um, dashed area where vehicles, right turning vehicles are to yield to through bicyclists, um, thus creating a circumstance where at the intersection, bicyclists are in between right turning vehicles and through vehicles. Um, this alternative proposes keeping the bike lane to the right of right turns, and this would only be possible through the installation of a bicycle signal face at the intersection and separate bicycle only phase, which are both proposed as um, upgrades to this alternative. Okay. All right, and the third alternative um, for the intersection with East Avenue um, is similar to the concept that Drew just shared with the exception of the bike treatment. And so in this alternative, uh, the intersection is realigned and upgraded and with relocated equipment um, like an alternative two. But in this alternative, as you can see on your screen, um, the eastbound bike lane is brought up to the intersection uh, so that um, it can navigate the intersection with the through vehicles. Um, so bringing up that bike lane uh, in between the through vehicles and the, the through lane and the right turn lane. Um, and then those bicyclists would be accommodated at the intersection with the through movement uh, vehicles. In this option, um, certainly the bicyclist is more exposed than with a dedicated bike signal um, that Drew just shared with us. And then the fourth alternative for the intersection with East Avenue um, is carrying forward the concept from previous planning efforts uh, to have a roundabout in this location. The roundabout would also square up the intersection uh, with East Avenue, bringing it closer to a 90 degree angle with Colchester Avenue. Um, and it would realign the entrance to UVM's Trinity campus as well. Uh, the roundabout would have, as shown here, an inscribed diameter of 110 feet um, and formalize the crossings on all four approaches. Um, so a little bit different than what's out there today and um, would certainly provide you know, more access uh, in that regard. And similar to the corridor concepts, um, these intersections were evaluated side by side uh, through the evaluation matrix um, with cost, safety, impacts, and community character as, as the metric. From a relative cost standpoint, um, we're seeing a range of the treatment options from simply upgrading uh, and relocating equipment 
um, sort of represented as the single dollar sign here, uh, all the way up to you know the significant road reconstruction work um, that would go into a realignment and then um, even so, more so with a roundabout option. For clarification, uh, Karen, a question was raised about cost. Um, and there was a question about whether the construction of the entrance road shift on that north leg into UVM in the movement of UVM's EV charging stations, if that was taken into financial consideration. And just to address that, I mean, it, it did receive the highest rating of dollar signs. So there isn't a higher rating to go to, but we do understand and do want to be clear that the roundabout option will, will be more costly than the other alternatives. Absolutely. All right, in terms of safety, um, for vehicle safety evaluations of these um, alternatives, we turn back to the Highway Safety Improvement Program evaluation that was conducted at this location. Um, that report, uh, as Drew had mentioned earlier, um, saw that the predominant crash type was rear end type crashes. Um, these were often occurring when the light has turned red and the second vehicle fails to stop or when the light has turned green. Um, and these crashes were indicative of that signal head visibility issue. Um, some other uh, mitigation that was um, recommended out of that report uh, was to add signal back plates and, and update the equipment there. Um, update the pedestal mounted equipment that's out there today. Um, all of the signalized intersection options uh, presented here would update that equipment um, and help to realign that equipment with its assigned lane so that um, when you're sitting there at the intersection, um, you know, you're facing the signal head on and, and know which signal is for you um, as, you're, as you're sitting there waiting for your turn. Um, the recommendations from the report to realign East Avenue um, and realign the UVM driveway were also considered in alternatives two and three here. Um, so that's seen as, a, as an improvement. Um, alternative four would lower vehicle speeds and um, produce fewer conflict points at the intersection. So well documented um, that uh, roundabouts improve um, safety in terms of the number of conflict points. Um, because of this, the roundabout was definitely considered to be uh, a significant improvement over the existing condition. And then in terms of bike safety, um, the separation of bikes at the intersection through a dedicated signal and phase in alternative two uh, would be an improvement over the other alternatives that are presented here. Um, and for pedestrian safety, uh, the signal protected crossings were considered the greatest improvement for safety. So um, although we're reducing conflict points and, and providing more access with the roundabout option for pedestrians, um, you know, having that signalized crossing uh, was viewed as um, a significant improvement. And in terms of the impacts of the intersection treatments, um, these were also compared side by side in all four cases. Um, there would be major impacts to utilities, um, minor impacts to the right of way. Um, most of that is through the impacts um, on that northern side of the intersection there um, at East Avenue. Um, for alternative one, this would involve uh, new or relocated mast arm poles and mast arms um, and a more a minor effort, effort in terms of constructability. Uh, for the other alternatives, the major road work required for realignment or roundabout development would be um, pretty significant. For the realignment and the roundabout uh, intersection treatments, there would be a reduction of two to three parking spaces along East Avenue, right <coughs> the intersection there. Um, and minor impact to trees. Uh, there are one to two trees that are really close to the intersection there. And so um, it's anticipated that there would be impacts to those two trees in the, in the area immediately around the intersection. And then um, it's important to note that there was an archeological assessment of the corridor 
um, and that had recommended that areas um, along UVM Trinity campus frontage there, um, any impacts beyond the existing back of sidewalk um, really should undergo an additional review, um, just as that was identified as uh, a sensitive area. Not necessarily anything known, but um, just to have folks looking at that if there are impacts beyond the back of, of existing structures. I'm ready for some, oh, sorry. <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> Uh, the alternatives that leverage um, curbing to separate facilities and provide green belt space uh, were considered improvements in the, to the aesthetics of the corridor um, in this, or excuse me, to the intersection in this case. Um, so that uh, was an improvement for alternative two and alternative four. All of the intersection alternatives uh, would satisfy the purpose and need, particularly in terms of safety. Um, the upgrades to equipment, striping um, would address the primary recommendations from that um, Highway Safety Improvement Program report. Um, and then the realignments uh, in alternatives two and three would follow through on the secondary recommendations from that report. So really the focus on safety at this intersection, um, all of these alternatives would, would help to uh, satisfy uh, those recommendations. And then the roundabout alternative would uh, similarly provide significant improvements to safety at this high crash location in the country. Hey, Karen, can I just ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. Can we, you don't need to go back, you can stay where you're at um, as far as the slide goes. But I had a question come in over email and I was just wondering, thinking that now might be the right time to address it, just the traffic performance of the roundabout compared to the signalized intersections. I think people kind of know what the congestion looks like today on a daily basis with the signal, but uh, this person was specifically curious as to how the roundabout would perform comparatively. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And, and certainly in the existing condition, the delay, um, particularly for folks um, on East Avenue uh, is, is pretty significant. Um, and so, Overall, the intersection and the existing condition doesn't um, perform all that well, um, but the roundabout would be a slight improvement over the existing condition uh, in terms of the level of service or level of service for the roundabout that we've laid out. Um, and, you know, it would improve upon the condition for um, the approach that sees the most significant delays. So in terms of, you know, the experience de delay waiting for that signal um, in the existing condition, it would be uh, an improvement over the existing condition. Thanks. Ready for additional questions? Um, the first one was the one that was brought up earlier, which is if I am a cyclist heading westbound, how do I turn left to go on to East Avenue? on any of these alternatives. They understand how on the roundabout, but how do they do it on the other alternatives? Um, that would be covered with uh, two stage left turn boxes at the East Ave intersection. We um, would have room to build those in. Uh, they, are show they were shown in the layout uh, concepts as well. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the two stage left turn box, you would enter it on your green signal for westbound travel. Uh, you would queue there out of the way of any conflicting vehicular or bicyclist movements. And then when the, uh, you would be detected for that southbound movement, um, and then you would go with this vehicular green for that movement to cross onto East Avenue and head southbound. Another one is, can alternative one work with separated raised bike lanes? Um, so just, I'll click back to the, so the intention of this slide at the start was to um, suggest that the Western concepts are shown grouped with the alternatives to the East and at the intersection that work with those concepts. So in this case, um, the short answer is no, the on-street separated bike lanes would not work with um, what's being proposed and the other alternatives. It is intended that concept one works with concept one East and alternative one at the intersection. Okay. 
Um, another clarification that there is still, there are some impacts also to Trinity Road at UVM um, in those EV charging stations, even when that intersection is just being shifted. So just a, a comment on that as a, you know, differentiator, I suppose. Um, what are the emergency vehicle impacts with option four, the roundabout, all the ambulance passing, pass through this intersection to get to the UVM Medical Center? Uh, so that was assessed. Do you go want ahead, me to go or? Sorry. Okay, so that, that was no problem. That was assessed. Um, this question came up at the local concerns meeting as well as our advisory committee uh, meetings uh, as if we do have a representative from the UVM Medical Center on the, on the um, advisor committee and we assessed it uh, against vehicular speed, emergency vehicular speeds of up to 10 miles an hour uh, can travel through the roundabout, which we see as being pretty analogous with uh, an emergency vehicles approach to a signalized intersection with um, sirens and lights uh, blazing, we, we see as minimal speed differential between the signalized intersection and the roundabout um, in this case. And the roundabout alternative does have um, uh, a truck apron, but the 10 mile an hour assessment that was done, um, I believe does uh, account for avoiding that truck apron um, as the implication of any vertical deflection for an emergency vehicle is less than desirable. Clarifying questions on the roundabout. In the separated bike lane options, how do bikes enter and exit through the roundabout? How, how do bikes get around the roundabout, I guess would be the question, if they're in a separated bike lane. What, what's happening at that roundabout for the bicyclists? Um, I, I don't know if it might help to put the slide up again, but the mm -hmm. intent would be for a bicyclist to already be in the separated bike lanes entering the roundabout. Otherwise, there are striped um, bike crossings that can be utilized to enter the enter and exit the roundabout at each leg. So you would go down, if you were headed eastbound, you would travel a little bit down the east have leg and can cross. You, with, can you show that with your mouse? Because it's really what you just described doesn't really explain how you where the shared bike lane or where the separated bike lane actually gets you from one side of that intersection to the other. Can you just talk it through with your mouse showing me where you're gonna go? Um, I unfortunately am just sharing the PowerPoint presentation window for the sake of the public presentation. I'm not sure I can trace with my mouse as a result. Why don't, why don't we attempt to just uh, dis to describe it? So if you're coming yeah. from the West, if you're coming from VM Medical Center and you're in that dark gray, which is where the cyclist is traveling. They're going to... I, I can see your cursor. Yeah. Oh, you can? Yeah. yeah. Can you hey, see Drew, it? This is um, Matt from VHB. Oh, okay. If you go up to the top of your screen and click on view options, there's an option yeah. to annotate that will let you draw if you'd like. Oh, you can start fun. calling oh, yeah. highlight. Let's see, let's see this, Picasso. Just remember, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> yes. All right. We'll make it green because bikes are green. Um, so, as Jen was alluding to, um, Andrea, to answer your question, if you are an eastbound cyclist, the idea is that you will already be in the separated facility. Um, to continue eastbound, you would. Oh, it's a little light. Can you guys see that? You would come down here and then similar to a pedestrian crossing, you would await for a gap or hopefully a yielding vehicle. You would cross the bike crossing here and then you would continue up here um, through the intersection to continue east. Thank you, that was helpful. Yep, and then similarly, if you were to turn left, you would travel all, all the way around um, the roundabout to then proceed on East Avenue, um, et cetera, et cetera. Still on that similar topic, if you are a cyclist, is there enough room? Are the splitter islands wide enough that on my bike I can make it halfway across before I have to look in the other direction to continue my crossing? Yes, the, the medians um, shown here followed pedestrian guidance for refuge islands, so they are minimum of uh, six feet of space. So uh, if you are in a tandem bicycle, it might be one crossing. However, if you're on a single bicycle, you could queue in that space in the median and then proceed. One other question regarding safety. Does mm -hmm. the roundabout slowing speeds provide safety elsewhere on the corridor in a way that the signalized intersections don't? 
does that give it kind of a, you know, when we're thinking about our safety evaluation, is there is there a kind of a bump for the roundabout as a result? Because it isn't just improving the safety of the intersection, but it could have more of an effect on the corridor. Karen, do you want to take that? That's a really great question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess I would anticipate that um, with a roundabout, you're going to have more free flowing traffic. Um, so if you think of you know shorter queues or, or delays on any of the approaches, um, just because folks aren't going to be waiting for a signal. Um, so in that regard, it might actually be um, you know folks moving along. But uh, to your point, I think you know by design the roundabout is. Um, supposed to slow people down um, uh, along those approaches. So I think in the immediate vicinity of the, of the intersection along each approach, um, you'll see reduced speeds, but maybe a more continuous flow of traffic. Um, but then, you know, the other treatments along the corridor are really where we may see um, a speed reduction as we're sort of squeezing lanes down and, and um, you know, limiting uh, how much how much space folks have when they're uh, in a vehicle. Um, so that sort of narrowing of the roadway um, has the effect of traffic calming and, and slowing people's speed. So um, the combination of both, I think, would ultimately result in some slower speeds along the corridor. But um, in the immediate vicinity of, of this intersection with a roundabout, I definitely anticipate that there would be um, Lower speeds. Another question, if I'm a commuter cyclist, am I likely to um, be able to navigate the roundabout in the road itself and not do that or can be kind of a cumbersome, you know, movement to get to do like the crossings as a pedestrian? By design, um, there are many examples of roundabouts basically accommodating both. So you know, for those cyclists that are are interested but maybe not bold, um, those folks can use the crossings that we're showing on the screen here. Um, and then, oftentimes, as a design element, um, you can provide uh, access for those those bolder, braver cyclists to um, hop into the roadway there and and navigate as a vehicle. Um, so, certainly, we could. To accommodate both, but I think that would be more of a design element that mm -hmm. would be decided upon in, in sort of the next phase of a project that was implementing a roundabout. Right, I think everything else I have now is more commentary and not clarification questions. I think now we'll take our final um, immediate response poll for the intersection alternatives and then we'll open it up for public input and general discussion. And that poll is open. You're already at 75%. Everybody felt strongly about this one, huh? <laughs> This is great. We'll give it another 15 seconds or so. Eighty-nine percent participation. This mm -hmm. is great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Um, five seconds. Last call for the three people out there who haven't voted. I know at least one of those is a phone user. Okay, we're going to end the poll. And everyone should see the results pop up. <clears throat> so I think we are ready then to enter our um, kind of a discussion portion of our evening. I will start by reading what it has already been raised in the chat for either commentary or, yeah, it's mostly commentary opinions. Um, 
you know, a little additional information and then we can open it up to folks if you do have a comment or I don't know, Matt, if I'm stealing your thunder because I've had to do a few of these without backup. Um, Matt, would you want to be the one who calls on folks and um, elevates them or would you prefer that I do that? Happy to help out. <laughs> okay, excellent. I'll start by reading the, uh, the items and the questions and answer. Um, there was a comment from Rick Sharp that there's a concern that 11 feet of public right of way is being ceded to adjoining landowners on each side of the street. That right of way could be better utilized for public transportation as it was intended. Um, that could allow separation of the sidewalk and the, right, the raised bike path on the north side of the street up the hill. Um, in addition, there was, you know, some re a response to an earlier question about the perception of safety is, impact, is important because it impacts human behavior, both on a bike and behind the wheel, resulting in situations that can be safer or less safe depending on the behavior. Um, and, you know, Glenn believes there's some literature on that point. It's just something to think about. <clears throat> uh, Peggy had commented back when there was consideration of the shared path, the shared use path option, that that could be used by kids riding to Edmonds Elementary or Middle School. Um, on the poll, there was a commentary that they wanted um, kind of a split option, a combination of 3A and 4 for that east section. So a modified option that was not put up as part of, part of a question. Um, the vastly reduced idling and ditching the electronic signaling and reduction in collisions and the roundabout is the most green option. And um, a contra opinion to that would be that they, this uh, opinion is that the roundabout does not have an improvement for cyclists. It is slightly less for uh, pedestrians, at least with a signalized intersection, bikes and peds can push a button and wait for the light. Um, that there's a concern that the roundabout will be less safe for cyclists and pedestrians. And those are all the comments that are in the chat. Matt, if you want to be the uh, moderator. Sure. So uh, we can continue to take questions via the Q&A tool, or if you would prefer to speak on mic, go ahead and click that raise hand button and we will unmute folks in the order they come in. We have, um, sorry, I didn't catch if you covered this. We had a question come in from Andrea uh, about stormwater. Yes. Okay, great. I just saw that one, thank you. If stormwater is not factored into these design at the early stages, it's a shame because any beautiful, perfect design will be non-functional if there's a storm that fills the roads paths with dirt, leaves and needles. Um, yes, that is entirely true. Once this reaches the engineering phase, that certainly would be something that would be considered right away to make sure that there is the, um, the stormwater accommodation to, to handle any of this impervious area. Agreed, Andrea, so noted. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we've got two raised hands and really quickly, uh, let's just remind, I, we have at least one person out there on the phone. If you'd like to raise your hand, press star nine and we can let you unmute. Uh, first off, we've got Rick Sharp. Uh, Rick, I'm going to allow you to unmute and you can ask your question. Yep. Um, as to uh, the roundabout, um, I always believe that roundabouts were built for cars, not for pedestrians and bicycles. And I think that's true of this one as well. I think you're all um, used to the concept of desire lines. And I think if you lay the desire lines down on a round on that roundabout, you will discover that people will not be using the crosswalks. They will instead go straight across um, the um, roundabout, both on bikes and um, on pedestrians on feet um, as well. Um, I think that that design forces the bikes out into the traffic, which is exactly what you don't want to do. Um, and therefore um, the roundabout is a complete disaster. Probably also costs more than all the other improvements that you're gonna to make to that Colchester right of way um, combined um, to put that in. And I think it's very unsafe for um, the emergency vehicles as well. So I'm very opposed to um, the concept of the roundabout. The last thing that I think is a big problem, and I'd like you to address it directly if you could, is that if you have um, signals at all the crosswalks that um, you can stop the traffic, 
what is to prevent those um, crosswalks from um, from being activated and thereby backing up all the traffic so that it you know, goes right around the um, roundabout and becomes a big snarl. Um, I think there's a misunderstanding with the roundabout option, those would not be fully signalized crossings. You're gonna let people cross East Avenue and Colchester Avenue without the ability to stop the traffic? Well, we haven't figured out the exact approach and that there might be an um, inappropriate location for an RFB, but because the pedestrians are only crossing traffic approaching from one direction, and that is not necessarily making a number of turning maneuvers, et cetera, it is a safer crossing location um, than many, many others. So yes, th those crossings will not be fully signalized. That's entirely insane. We have a, a little bit more feedback in the Q and A. Um, Anne, who is at 211 Colchester Ave, um, is concerned that she will have an impossible situation coming out of her driveway because of the roundabout. Um, I don't know, Anne, if it's because the splitter island would be blocking your driveway or what um, the concern is, because I know obviously if vehicles do queue on that approach to any of the alternatives, it would impact you. But I don't know if, if the concern is that the splitter island in particular would eliminate you from being able to take a left in and a left out. Um, and some of that we could obviously look at in design, but, um, but your concern is, is noted. Um, Greg has commented that the vast majority of pedestrian buttons in town are not responsive. Um, would new pedestrian buttons for peds or bikes be any more responsive than the ones that we have now? Um, I think this is kind of a two-part concern. I think this is something that if there are locations where um, the pedestrian buttons are not working, that is something um, that you should probably speak about a speech of the city about kind of separately offline from this in any alternative where we would be putting in new traffic signal equipment, though, that would be in any of the signalized alternatives that would be upgrades of equipment. Um, and so everything would be fully operational and, and new when it went in. Um, so it would need to be operational. Um, ben, can I just add a plug for sure. if if that is occurring around the city, um, see click fix is a great way to elevate that issue um, to folks at the city to fix any issues with head buttons not activating a crossing. And that's on the city website, see click fix. I can share a link. Excellent. Um, there was a concern raised that Kathy's flower shop needs parking for their business. Um, I know Jason, I believe, did a little bit of discussion with Kathy's flower shop. Um, Jason, you want to just weigh in on that concern? Yeah, I can speak to that. We did meet with the uh, one of the owners uh, of Kathy Flower Co. and went over the alternatives with them. You know, in a perfect world, they, they would appreciate some parking spaces on Colchester Avenue. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're very supportive of the alternatives to make it safer for bicycling on Colchester Avenue. And you know, they also have, as you know, during the summer, at least uh, an, an ample amount of um, parking uh, on the adjacent street. Is it Latham Court? Mm -hmm. And that for the most part is, is sufficient for their business needs and they also have employee parking out back um, behind their business um yeah and largely they were they were supportive of um, the alternatives to make it safer for bicycling along the corridor okay we've got a few raised hands so we'll try to get to in order um jonathan weber going to go ahead and allow you to unmute. Hey, folks, uh, Jonathan here from Local Motion. Um, is, it, is it possible to look at uh, 3A um, on the campus kitchen section, the E section? So just my, my, my one of my questions here is, um, you know, I, was, I asked a few questions about the, the lane widths just 
it seems like we're so close to having room for the continuous raised bike lane and the sidewalk and avoid this mixed use zone, which seems a little hazardous to me. It's, it's not a compromise we would ever ask of people driving to like, you know, share, share their, their space in that sort of same unpredictable way that I think this, this will, this will work. Um, why not narrow the green belts by one foot to find that extra two feet for the sidewalk and the, and the separated bike lane? Uh, that could, that could certainly be considered. Cool. Yeah, I, I think that would, that would be great to look at. And if not that, I, I agree with the other person you mentioned, maybe looking at the property right away. I think achieving that continuous bike lane would be really worthwhile. Um, beyond that, I think, I think this is, these are really great concepts. Um, I think the separated raised bike lanes are, are really what this corridor needs. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people walking and biking here. There are a lot of new users, as we know, buying bikes. Uh, as bike shops are sold out. Um, and this kind of infrastructure is really what makes folks feel safe. Um, and we know that when folks feel safe, they're more inclined to ride. Um, and there is a really strong safety in numbers effect when there are more folks out riding, uh, drivers tend to watch for people riding more. Um, and that, that really increases the safety. Um, as far as the roundabout is concerned, I do think those, the splitter island width is worth looking at. There are a lot of people riding cargo bikes, bringing their kids to school on cargo bikes. Um, and those are certainly longer uh, oftentimes than the 60 inches that I think was mentioned for those Splitter Island refuges. So just some things to look at there. Um, and I would also love to see a way uh, for people riding to merge into um, sort of that car travel lane um, so that they don't have to use the crosswalks. Uh, if they're a more advanced, comfortable rider. So thanks for this work. I think, uh, you know, any, any combination of these improvements with the raised lanes um, and the roundabout or the bike uh, signal improvements would be really worthwhile. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan, can I also just provide you, um, when the idea of a mixing zone was raised, I was very hesitant about it at, at first. And one of the things that actually um, made me think it was a, an alternative worth carrying forward was the fact that there is a lot of friction in that area. There are a lot of people getting out of cars and walking across the spike lane. And if nothing else, whether that alternative gets carried forward, it is definitely something as the design move forward to just think about how we alert the, the cyclist who might be going a little faster that this could be happening. And, and likewise, the pedestrian who's crossing that area, that this is an area that, so <clears throat> treating it with a different texture did appeal to me for that very reason. This is really a mixing zone because you do have folks coming and going from, from the parking and going to get their takeout, et cetera. So we do have a couple of other comments in the chat. Um, one is that the crosswalk buttons should be reachable by someone in a wheelchair. That is, that's a great comment. And anything with a new, a new traffic signal, we would make sure it's um, ADA compliant, um, of course, as that gets designed. And um, that the color of raised bike lanes should be different and very obvious to pedestrians on the sidewalk to avoid that kind of that, the mixing where mixing is not intended. Those were two other pieces of feedback in the chat. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we still have three raised hands left. I'm going to move to Jason next. Jason, you uh, should be able to unmute and go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, one thing I think we have to consider is that this is going to be maybe a 20 or 30 year investment. And so changes going forward are going to be here for a long time. Uh, some of the details I like to see are maybe some of the behind sidewalk impacts. Uh, to the individual property owners, a um, uh, property owner in the area. Um, the overlay to the tree impacts, um, I understand there's some green belt impact and as well as ones behind the sidewalk, um, just figuring out which trees and letting people know which ones are impacted, I think is important for the neighborhood communication and overlaying the bus stops and how they work into the plan. I couldn't really see in any of the plans where the bus stops are and how they uh, facilitate into that. I think that needs to be more, made more clear. Um, as far as my preference, I think bikes versus pedestrians, if you wanna call it that, is better than um, 
bikes versus cars or vehicles, um, keeping a separation between high moving, you know, large vehicles and people on bikes and walking is very important. So I, I appreciate all the separated options as being viable. Um, and where you can look at it, like it's been brought up, but uh, when it rains, the stormwater down the street is very heavy, sometimes several inches. So whichever one facilitates the best uh, you know, stormwater, I think that's important. And where you can bury the utilities, that's important as well, because uh, they present an op obstacle to the greenbelt space and a number of other things. But overall, I support any number of the options going forward to improve what's there. But uh, the best one is thinking forward for the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Up next, we've got Lonnie. Lonnie, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to unmute. Thank you. So I, I heard one comment saying that now that the bikes are gonna be in the bike lane, they won't be in the vehicle lanes. And I'm not sure that that's um, something <clears throat> that's that's part of the legal framework of Vermont. My understanding is that a bicycle can go anywhere that a car goes on a public road. So there still might be cyclists who want to go really fast, who um, you know if they if they feel that the bike lane is obstructed in some way or has trash or something, they may still want to be in the bike lane. And I can see that, and, and so on one hand, they'd have a legal right to that. On the other hand, it would be easy for a car driver to get upset that there is a cyclist in their, in their lane. So I, I'm not quite sure how to resolve that. Um, but I, I think that's something you want to consider. And maybe it's a public education or something, I don't know. Uh, the second thing is that we're voting now as sort of, um, Without, without the constraints of money. Um, we all know that some of the alternatives are more money than others, but it's not coming out of our pockets when we're voting. So I just would encourage you to take that into account. Um, if we were voting and that included like a tax increase or something, maybe we would vote differently. So I just wanted to point that out also. And um, the third thing is, I, I myself voted for the separated lanes, but I would hate to see the separated lane, separated bike lane that's going down Colchester Avenue turn into a canal when it rains. Um, so stormwater might be a really big, a big deal, especially if the lane is separated and it sort of is turning into a trout. Um, that's it for my comments, thank you. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Up next, we've got uh, Cheryl Flash. Cheryl, I'll go ahead and allow you to talk. Should be able to unmute now. Thank you very much. Um, I definitely like the idea of the background behind all these proposals. On um, my mind, it's um, slowing down a major corridor coming into uh, Burlington, whether it's um, Colchester Ave or Wollaston Road or Shelburne Road, Main Street. Um, so all these, um, efforts to narrow the road I approve of, and I certainly see the roundabout as one of those um, infrastructures that will help people realize that coming into our city is, is not a rush, you know, to get downtown or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm aware that roundabouts are extremely controversial and they're often or probably always the most expensive option. Um, and despite my strong preference for bicycling, um, this is, seems to be the one case where I would push for the increased safety for motor vehicles as um, I feel that the way motor vehicles behave, you know, affects us all. So um, I don't expect that I'm ever going to be able to um, change uh, Rick's mind or probably Rick won't be able to change my mind. And I think to some extent you can always use different data sets, um, certainly. We've got plenty of traffic engineers in our area that you know are strong proponents like Tony Reddington. Um, it, it's just great in my mind, since I happen to live on 
um, East Avenue to see the possibility of um, one of these um, safety enhancements be seriously considered. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, I just needed to respond and um, I think, think that's about the end of my uh, focus on safety and really looking to for this to happen in the future, whenever it is. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. We have one more raised hand um, and whoever you are, you're showing up as a Galaxy S8 Plus. So I'm gonna allow you to talk, but if you could just do us a favor and just state your full name so we know who you are, that'd be great. Okay, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I didn't mean to be the mystery guest. My name is Sharon Busher. Um, and um, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I did listen to the presentation and now I've heard it a second time and maybe I've missed it, but you know, it is pedestrian focused also. So the sidewalks all along Colchester Avenue, are they going to be looked at and improved as far as, as leveling so that there aren't areas where people trip? Um, I haven't heard any, I've heard, you know, with, with shared paths, definitely, but I haven't heard any specifics around all of the sidewalks along this corridor being looked at and improved for safety for the pedestrian. I can, I can go ahead and address that quickly. Um, just pertaining to this study, Sharon, uh, the alternatives being proposed would result in more than likely a complete uh, streetscape reconstruction, in which case those sidewalks, because in a lot of the alternatives they are being relocated, would be uh, reconstructed and would no doubt be sure to um, check all of the required standards in terms of state design and ADA standards. So, and, and I thought most of it would be, but I wasn't sure if it would be complete. Like this is a complete street. I would like to see this a complete pedestrian way. And so I just wanted to understand that and just get that on the record. Um, so that to make sure that I know it, sidewalks are expensive. I'm not naive in this process, um, but I, I would like to make sure that um, the pedestrian is also given priority here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. We have uh, one more raised hand. Um, Jen, did you want to check in with the Q&A? Uh, yes, a few things did come in via Q&A. Um, one of the questions is, can bikes and peds be part of the automatic signal at a signalized intersection so the pedestrian buttons are not necessary and yes we did analyze the operations of the signalized intersections a number of different ways and um, some of which could just be concurrent and come up automatically or others which are for an exclusive pedestrian phase so there are a number of options at this intersection which of course would be fine-tuned if that is a selected alternative as it goes through design but there are options to accommodate pedestrians in either way um, Jenny has indicated she seconds what Jason said about public transportation as a regular bus rider. It would be very helpful to see how the bus stops interact with these options. Um, Jim has indicated that if we really want to add a roundabout to Burlington, let's try to find somewhere where it makes more sense, like replacing the jug handle or the Shelburne Street Rotary. And that's all the feedback in the Q&A. All right, um, we'll go now to Jack Hansen. Jack, I'll uh, allow you to unmute, go ahead. Great, thanks. And Jim, we're, we're working on the rotary for sure. Um, but it's a process. Um, but yeah, no, I just wanted to say, I think this is, this is really exciting. I think I often get frustrated that in criteria for these shifts to our, our transportation infrastructure, there isn't the criteria of the climate crisis, which to me is the overarching criteria that should take precedence in terms of our transportation system and the need to, to make changes to it rapidly. Um, but I do, that being said, I do think this project is one of the most exciting opportunities that we have. And 
that we've ever had in Burlington for that type of transformative change that would really, I think, shift things in a meaningful way in terms of um, the way that people are able to get around. I think we need this type of infrastructure, this raised and separated to really get new people who aren't already out there on bikes, who don't feel safe. And a city like Copenhagen that has tons of these all over the city has 50% of people in that city commuting by bike. So I think this is a starting point. And if we can get this, you know, in this part of the city, hopefully it can, it can spread from there and create a real network and really be a game changer. We do have another comment in the chat and it is something that we haven't really discussed um, during this, but it is, it was mentioned just briefly about ways to accommodate uh, parking that might be lost on the corridor. Jim wanted to just mention the potential for short-term parking in the Centennial North University Road entrance is something that UVM is willing to consider and discuss. <coughs> Uh, this would involve closing the eastern entrance exit and widening the western entrance exit to be two way that would allow for more temporary parking spaces on the east side of the parking. Could I ask? Go ahead, Jason. There was a question that came in via email to me in advance of this meeting and it was, um, and I, I apologize about I missed it um, in tonight's discussion, but it was with regard to the intersection of uh, East Ave and Colchester Ave as to whether the additional crosswalk could be put in at the signalized alternatives. So that would be crosswalk across Colchester Avenue on the western side of the intersection. Uh, Jason, that, that, that ties into uh, my comment a little earlier that yes, there is the potential for crosswalks on all legs of the intersection, but in that case, for, uh, there would probably have to be a shift to an exclusive pedestrian um, versus if you were to limit to just one crossing of Colchester Ave, you could create a situation where the crossings could be done concurrently with, with phasing. Um, which then makes it come up automatically. So that is a, you know, a detail I think that would be worked out later weighing whether it's the convenience of having all of the crossings at the intersection um, and how that then affects how those pedestrians are treated, whether they have to push a button to get an exclusive phase. Um, but those, those would be details that could be worked out. The answer is that yes, either alternative could work. Um, so I'm confident that uh, that, that could be if that that is desired that crosswalk could be put in thanks all right i don't have any additional raised hands so we're good there looks like we might have two more comments in the q a jen i don't know if we wanted to touch on those i'm sorry my apologies we do we have residential shared zone parking for a parking management plan instead of the way it's done currently by street is something that um, has been brought up in our process as a, as a desired um, a desired situation so that folks who currently park on Colchester Ave could park on different streets by zone. Um, thanks for remembering the additional sidewalk. There's already curb cuts and truncated dome plates for that western side crosswalk. This could and should be considered. And, uh, and then just a pat on the back for Drew and Karen's presentation. Awesome presentation and thanks so much. I had one more question. Um, I, that was probably a great note to end and I apologize for keeping this <laughs> You can just say that again when you're done, we, Jason. We do have a raised hand as well, Jason. <laughs> ah, there After you. We Okay, I won't be the last one. Um, there was a question about um, bike boxes at the um, signalized intersection. Was that something that we talked about tonight or could we consider it? Um, yeah, we did um, mention two stage left turn boxes for consideration, uh, primarily at Colchester Avenue and East Avenue, and then at all uh, signalized and unsignalized intersections along the way, we've created queue space for left turns for bicyclists along the corridor. Okay, I think yeah, Claire. specifically interested in, you know, right in front of the stop bar. Are we talking about the same thing? Um, 
Oh, so you're so I guess bike boxes versus two stage left turn boxes. Um, yes. Kind of uh, six and one half dozen the other. Um, uh, two stage left turn boxes came out as an interim approval from FHWA after bike boxes. Um, bike boxes have seen some effectiveness, but overall have seen to only address uh, improving bicycle safety for left turns during a red signal phase at intersections. And so there was a desire to create um, a condition that worked during all phases of a signalized intersection, in which case um, two stage left turn boxes were then researched and uh, then granted uh, interim approval by FHWA. So uh, that has been our preferred um, design consideration for intersection maneuvers, but we could, uh, if you know things advance to a design, we would consider all, all potential improvements for navigating intersections for bicyclists. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, we do have one more hand raise. Uh, we're gonna go to Greg. Go ahead and unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. There's some some really uh, uh, great ideas in here. Um, I just wanted to uh, voice my support of the of the roundabout option, and it's for for a few reasons. Uh, one is that I just feel a lot safer when I only have to cross one lane at a time, and especially on uh, that that eastbound section. Um, uh, of Colchester where it meets uh, East Ave, when you have that, when you have a dedicated right turn lane, the drivers really do not like to slow down when they have a dedicated turn lane. And uh, this would, this would reduce everybody to one lane, which would, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, really help to, to, to calm traffic. Um, and I think that, that, um, Rick's concern about drivers not yielding to pedestrians and bicyclists, I think, I think you could uh, do some things to, to encourage them to, to slow down even before they reach those crosswalks. Um, you know, you could raise the crosswalks, you could kind of have the whole thing be one big speed table. Um, I don't know, you all are the engineers, you could figure it out, but I think, I think that could be addressed. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that I think uh, that that uh, would be, would would be a great option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. All right. We do have a little bit more in the Q&A and <clears throat> we are really up against um, time here, but I will um, just go through. There was a thank you for addressing the bike park question and then a comment that the roundabout reduces three different left turn lanes. All right, well, with that, I'll click forward to our final slides here. Um, in case uh, I assume everybody can still see the presentation up on the screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, first and foremost, thank you for everybody's interest in this project. I think it's clear to see this is a, a you know, a heavily involved uh, public and it, it seems like, you know, we that's that's what really feeds these projects that's what keeps them going so thank you for your extremely thought out questions and um, great feedback also thank you all for being respectful to one another and to the project team these forums are always can can get heated uh and i thought everybody here was extremely respectful of all of the ideas being presented here so on behalf of the project team thank you for that um just looking ahead uh for our scoping study the next steps will be to select a preferred alternative. Uh, from there, we will have one final, uh, third and final meeting with our advisory committee, um, in which case we will then um, have our refined uh, preferred alternative. And with that, we will then bring that recommendation to the Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee, um, as well as City Council for their approval. Um, we did have, I know we are over time, we did have final poll questions. I don't know, Jason and Nicole, uh, the, to revisit the selected alternatives. I know at this point, I think we have had a few people drop off. I'm not sure if it is appropriate to ask those questions or what, uh, just figured I'd gauge people's thoughts on that. Uh, do we want one final poll for people's preferred alternatives? That's a good question. I think, um... My guess is, judging by the comments, and since we've lost, uh, you know, several, several of our attendees, um, 
I didn't get a sense from comments that people necessarily change their mind based mm -hmm. on our additional conversation. So I feel like the information that we got from the initial poll um, is probably good. And then we're you know, being respectful of everybody's time tonight. Um, don't yeah. want to belabor that. Perfect. Yeah, well, I would say if you, if you had a huge change of heart, um, please do email me about that. And, you know, we could make that subtle adjustment or just kind of note that when we're, we're looking at this and then preparing to um, bring this to the advisory committee at their next meeting, uh, which should be sometime in, in February. Um, we're still trying to schedule that, but just so you're aware of um, what timeline we're looking at, we're thinking like mid-February um, tentatively right now. And just clarification on the last slide, um, the advisory committee will be making their recommendation of a preferred alternative, and then that will go to the Public Works Commission, the two, and then the city council eventually makes the actual decision there. Thank you for the clarification there, Jason. And I think um, with that, thank you all for your attendance. Um, if there are any other Closing remarks from the project team, please feel free. Otherwise we will, uh, as Nicole said, be respectful of everybody's time and let you return to your Monday evening.